Hello, Fearless Gamers, and welcome to another podcast here on Fearless Games. I'm Matt the Vet, and today I'm joined by... James the Wildcard. And Elena's in the background playing Pikmin 3 on the Wii U. So, just us two. Yes. Yes. All the time. (laughs) So, how's it going? Good, good. How's it going? Pretty good. Um, As you know, I went on vacation a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. It it was awesome. I, I swam with dolphins. Nice. And they were like, word up. <laughs> Did they tell you what's the word, word up? It, eh. <laughs> that was the word. Oh, huh. it wasn't bird? No, it was eh. Ah, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were trying, I, they might have been trying to do the sound of a seagull to tell me that the word was the bird. Right. Because, you know, they, they hang out with seagulls all the time. Yeah, you know, those those eagles of the sea. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> oh, so I'm. I just wanted to say that uh, uh, I'm super excited for the expansion for um, for Diablo Three. There's an expansion they for Diablo 3. Diablo Three Reaper of Souls. Looks like the bad guy is going to be the Archangel of Death. Interesting. Which is the way I expected them to go, but it's cool because it's cool and it's a new cl- a class called the Crusader. Which is, I guess, their take on giving us the paladin back. And he looks cool. I guess. He looks like he has cool abilities. And, you know, whether people liked or disliked the way Diablo 3 ran, I really enjoyed the Diablo storyline and the way Diablo does stuff. And I really enjoyed Diablo 3. So I'm looking forward to this expansion. The, I liked, I liked the story in it. Um, I was a little confused on how things happened for things to happen in the game. I don't want to give away yeah, yeah. spoilers to anyone who hasn't played the game. Um, two things that I was not a fan of, which one of them I didn't realize until later, was one was the game was more level-based right. than the others, where, like, because there was a point where I just couldn't beat the character. I had to leave and grind before I could go to it. Mm-hmm. Whereas in, like, Diablo 1 or Diablo 2, clever tactics and crazy use of things, you could kill things that you're not supposed to. Yeah, but, I mean, I think with Diablo 2 also, because I... I Alright, so Fearless Gamers know, I was a hardcore Diablo 2 Like, the way people are hardcore about um, Call of Duty is the way I was hardcore about Diablo 2 when it first came out. <laughs> All right, that's bad. Like I had the gear that was the gear to win all gears. I I I ground and grinded and I did and I PV I did everything in the L suit. And I was in, that was before the expansion came out. Mm-hmm. And there was a process that you could do in the Apple too to grind levels up because they, there is a, there is kind of a guide. Like you know, you get up to, you have to be at least level twenty five to solo. Um, What's his face? Duriel. You had to be at least level 40 to do something like, you know, they had for each class and the way you're supposed to do it. And the thing with Diablo 2, though, is like you said, there was some clever tomfoolery you could do to try and bypass that. <laughs> yep. And the only other thing that I didn't like, and the Stark Lord mentioned this, and I do agree, is the fact that to get to the harder levels in multiplayer, you have to play through the game like six times. Like, I would have loved if when we were running through the game, if we could have just started on Nightmare Mode. But we couldn't, because half of us were did, quote-unquote, unlock Nightmare Mode. Well, yeah, but similarly, Diablo 2 was the same way. You had to beat Normal to get into Nightmare. You had to beat Nightmare to get into Hell and, and all that. So, that is kind of a nuisance. The one thing I did like over Diablo 3 that Diablo 2 has... So we could start in Act One and go all the way to Act Five if you wanted to in Diablo Two. You know what I mean? Like as long as as long as you as long as you unlock the ability to be in that act, you didn't have you know you could bypass all the all the quests in between and do the last quest in Act Five if you, if you wanted. That that is true. You are kind of forced if one person in your party didn't do a level, you're he's kicked out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's kind of the same way here. Only if you start all the way, like, yeah, but you don't get access to the quest if you decide to join in, in Act Three. You know what I mean? If you decide to make an Act Three game. Yeah, you can't really do anything prior. But yeah, what, what I liked about Diablo Three 
is that it still carried the Diablo feel to it. Like, Diablo 2 was around for so long, we got so used to it that I think that's why there's a lot of resistance to the way Diablo 3 did things. Mm. But Diablo 3, gameplay-wise, was a lot of fun. Like, the whole, like, making gems and making yeah. cool stuff, you didn't even need to worry about that if you don't want to. I mean, you could yeah. do whatever you wanted. Yeah, the mechanics were fine. I, that was no problem. Oh, yeah, and it's just, and it still had that classic feel that I really enjoyed mm. out of Diablo. And that's the one thing, as these games get more and more, I, I don't want to say advanced, but as you know, gaming progresses the way it does, you kind of lose some feel of things. But I feel Diablo 3 kept the Diablo feel of the fact that it's, hey, we are going to be up against ridiculous odds, and for some reasons we're able to overcome them. <laughs> I did like that they kind of brought it back. Now, I don't want to say more horror-like, because I was never afraid to play the, any of the Diablo games. But yeah. Diablo 1 is very dark and horror-y. Diablo yeah. 2 was more like me- medieval action with a little bit of like horror element of, hey, we're fighting demons and the undead. The only scary part in that game at, I, that at least maybe just like go, huh, was when the Wanderer explodes in Act 2, I think it was, in the very beginning. Act 3. Act 3, yeah, that was the only time where they got me to go like, oh, that was, like, kind of surprising. Yeah, no, exactly. But, like, the, the, like, I feel Diablo 1 had that horror element and that, oh my god, we're creeping through this dungeon and it's really, you know, like, we're desperate. The Butcher was always creepy. Yeah, the Butcher was always creepy and annoying. <laughs> but, uh, Act 1, uh, not Act 1, Diablo 1, while it was story, I'd say what made it do well was the feel it gave. The unnatural kind of you know, get the willies type of feel that you want as you got through the dungeons. Because you're yeah. always inside something enclosed. Then Diablo 2, it had so much awesome story in there that you could experience or not, depending upon if you read everything and listened to everything. So much awesome story. But it lost some of that horror feel because a lot of the stuff was done on outside. You know? Yeah, and Diablo three kind of brought it back a bit by having more internal stuff and just generally being a bit darker than Diablo two was, which is funny because people are like, oh my god, there's a rainbow in Diablo three. It's so light now, and it's like, no, they're just they were just showing off the graphics engine, guys. They were just showing off the graphics engine. Yeah, I love how um, dark games aren't allowed to have the mis- the colorful elements of nature in them yeah like in the world in the world of horror rainbows do not exist apparently like the laws of physics and light bending does not and reflection reflection does not happen in horror universe oh no and apparently grass is, is a duller shade of green in the horror universe as well and trees are just that much gloomier and i and they have no leaves oh yeah never leaves never leaves and <laughs> but, uh, what are you crazy but, uh, <laughs> and Diablo 3 though had the color a bit like when he, when he went through certain areas of Act 1 you're like huh look at this luscious forest you know it was cool I liked that I liked the fact they were like listen just because but, we're showing nature doesn't mean we're a bunch of pansies <laughs> well it also in a sense I feel that makes things a little bit more horrific because it's like crap this doesn't look out of the ordinary and Things out of the ordinary are happening. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I liked about it. And I'm just super excited for Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls. They, what's cool is they have a gameplay trailer kind of showing off the um, Crusader a little bit and some stuff. Mm-hmm. And they have the cinematic trailer, which is, of course, now, whether you love or hate any Blizzard games, you cannot deny that their cinematic trailers are some of the best things on the market. They have some of the prettiest cutscenes. Like, they should... I, I don't know what they do... But I feel if a company, if, a, if let's say some producer wanted to make a cinematic movie, they should just go to Blizzard. Yeah, I mean, they make gorgeous cinematics. They do. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They, that's where GW should go for um, a Space Marine movie or something like that. Yeah, and, and you know... The, Though I must say that Inquisitor film, I haven't seen much of it lately, but... That the last bit I saw was pretty sick looking. It was, and you know the Dawn of War. Did that ever happen? I don't know if it ever happened. I know they're still. I think the last I heard, they were still working on it and trying to figure things out. If anyone knows the latest on that Inquisitor movie, drop a comment. Exactly, but I will say that the Dawn of War cinematics were also very top notch. Yes, yes, I did enjoy them. Though one thing that I will say 
is, is in Retribution, I don't know if it was just me, but the ending scenes for a lot of the armies, minus the Blood Ravens, felt a little unfinished. It did feel a little odd, but I, I just chalk it up to the fact that um, part of it is I feel that the Blood Raven, I don't know what the canon is, but I feel that in that story arc, the Blood Raven ending is supposed to be the canon ending, so yeah. a little bit more. Well, it's, it's, like, it's more like they threw in like legit cinematics into their ending, and it looked like the rest of them, they just, it looked like they started with in-game sprites, started to slightly clean them up, and then just went, ah, screw it, we're on a deadline. Yeah, you never know. But that's just yeah. me. That's just me personally. But uh, and, like, but this, so yeah. If anybody is interested in Diablo at all, Reaper Souls is coming out in 2014. Now, now we all know who are Blizzard fans that this could mean 2018. Okay, so don't give your hopes up. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of new stuff coming out, we got a whole new Codex in the 40k universe. Yeah. The Space Marines are now officially out. They are, and I still stand by my thought about the what is it, Centurions? And the Iron Hands and the White Scars are still available. Nobody wants those limited edition codexes. Why? The Iron Hands one is cool, um, but yeah, the White Scar ones are like, but we're people too. Why does nobody want us? <laughs> we should get that for our thing. Yes. And that's not you know, that's not weird for people to hear, but <laughs> I still see. maybe maybe in many years yeah they'll know what we mean maybe. <laughs> but the Centurions, I still stand by this, my decision that they're weird looking. They they are um, the clown um, in the last podcast, which I forgot to put up, so we're gonna get like a double podcast going this week. Um, but the clown, he doesn't mind them. He thinks they're looking pretty awesome. He does like the mech boy conversion on them a lot more, and he plans if he ever does a non-biker orc, that's what he's going to do. But he is a big fan. If I recall correctly, he loved, he liked the drill arms. Oh, the, uh, the concept of, like, the drill arms are interesting. But, like, I, I, it's just this too – I think the, the, the chest weapon system, if that was just not there at all, I'd, I'd be a lot happier with it. It just seems too much. Um, the Stark Lord is, seems to feel, what's the point? This is what dreadnoughts are. This is what um, dreadnoughts and terminators are, are supposed to be for. Well, this is a this is bridging the gap between dreadnoughts and terminators, and it is true. Fluff wise, mm-hmm. when you think about it, terminator armor full technical name is tactical dreadnought armor. So we already have the man yeah. horrible dreadnought armor. Now this. What I do like about this is the potential for Iron Hands, because they're all about integrating weapons and bionics and all that. Mm. But if this was just kind of like, if this looked more like an add-on to Terminator armor and not a full-fledged different suit, I'd be okay with it. You know what I mean? Like, if this was just, Mm. we have, we hardwired a chest system and now we gave Terminators big guns. Cool. They could have easily done that. Like, and I don't. And looking at it, I don't know the rules. Looking at the shooting guys, do they have power fists, or they just have big gloves to hold the guns? Um, I'm going to guess that they just that um they might count as having a power fist. Yeah. Whereas the close combat dudes have the close combat weapons. And also, when you look at like the pictures, if you, look, if you go to their website for this game, and you look at the one picture, one of the quad split pictures. I think there's only one mm-hmm. of those. I forget. No, there's well, two there's of those. One though. for the one for each. Yeah, the, there's one on the that show the feet with the weird like stabilizer pistons in the back. It just looks weird. And the, the thing that's weird about this, and which is why I like Terminator armor so much, is why I don't like this. There's a lot of exposed, delicate integral parts like those cylinders on the back of the feet that you, mm. you, you know you shoot those you take them out they're screwed you know like the Terminator everything was enclosed in the Terminator armor you didn't see any weak points this you know you got like the weird wires and cablings near their head you got the stabilizer things in the back you got a lot of stuff just sticking out there that's <laughs> kind of like you really supposed to armor this up right guys yeah <laughs> and with this we finally got a new FAQ yeah and they changed the servo arm. <laughs> kinda. That's pretty much it. Kinda. It's like a kinda change. It's like it's, like it's kind of something we all expected to do anyway. 
what what I loved is is the rule book. It says September thirteenth. They're like, oh, click, and nothing was changed in it. I know, right? The Imperial Guard. The only thing that got changed was the servo arm. Oh yeah. And, and that is all the, the other codexes. That was the only thing that was changed was the servo arm. Which I do, I do give them that credit for. It's just hey, let's 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 make all things on the same playing field now. Oh, yeah, and not pull a Dark Angels codex and go. You guys don't get this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I do like about going back to Centurions, though, I do like the fact that they're basically Terminator Devastators. You know, I've always thought, but I've always thought, and I think I said this to you before. You know, they're Terminators. Why couldn't they pick up a last cannon? You know, yeah. It's like, I think you said mentioned that once in the last time. Like they can hold a plasma cannon and an assault cannon and a heavy flamer. Why can't they hold? And they can mount missiles to the top of themselves. Why can't they hold anything they they please? They're the elite. They should be like, you know what? I want to shoot this gun. Why? Because yeah. I'm first company. That's why. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, speaking of that, we also got some FAQs from Forge World. Um, stuff that they forgot to put into the new Apocalypse book. Um, we got the Storm Blade, which is the Bane Blade with the Titan Plasma Gun on it. Right. And the Eldar Shadow Specters. The Adeptus Sacertus Repressor. Okay. And the Death Corpse of Krieg Siege Army list. And this Adeptus thing, oh, it's a Sisters of Battle Repressor. Yeah, that, that, their tank, right? Yes. One of their tanks. One of their yes, tanks. Yes, I think the tank that they made for them. It's basically like their Razorback without being, yep. you know, without being the emulator. It's like, right? And speaking of, I brought out a question to the fearless. Oh, and by the way, just before I forget, um, I did in a in an earlier podcast mention that the Warhound and the R- Reaver Titan were not in the Imper- the Apocalypse book, and I was wrong. Now, when I made that statement, I went to the units section of the book, <laughs> where you would find the unit entries, and they are not there. You're full of a talk. Why would you expect that? <laughs> in the Forge World book. The Chaos and Warhound Titan are in the Chaos Unit section. And they kept mentioning Void Shields. See the the Apocalypse book. I'm like, there's no mention of the Void Shields in the Apocalypse book. And so I'm just thumbing through, and I see a picture of a Warhound Titan in the Armageddon Battle Zone book. I click on it, and there are the stats for the stupid thing. Oh, clearly and that's I'm where going... you expect to find it. And now, for anyone who hasn't read the book... The Armageddon Battle Zone is like the last ten pages of the book. It, it is. Why is it up there? Why is it in the unit section? Are you telling me I can only use this in Armageddon's Battle Zone? Clearly. Clearly. Clearly that's the only time they use Titans. Obviously. Man, I can't find the picture. There's something I wanted to, to link you to, but I can't find the picture anymore that that Games Workshop had up. They had artwork for the Centurions that made them look cool, but the unit just doesn't fit. (laughs) And so, now, speaking of, like, just going back here, I asked the Fearless a question. Um, uh, Hopefully they answered on the last podcast. If you did not, feel free to answer in this one, but to you. And I'm going to make a slight addendum to this. If a dude came up to you, right? Right. He just said, look, go to the Forge World website, pick five things, regardless of price, regardless of what it is, five things, and any of those, like, walker things where the arms are separate or such, you get those with the unit, because that's totally unfair. Right. Which five would you pick? Ooh, that's tough. Um, let's see here. Let's give me a look-see. Now, we're talking, like, books or, or books. as well? Scenery, whatever Forge World, if Forge World sells it, you can buy it. Like the Stark Lord did say he'd get a Manta because he said, screw it, I can get whatever I want. Oh, yeah, I mean, at that point, you get some crazy stuff. Now, that new, uh, the new Emperor's Children Phoenix Terminators, I, I maybe I'll put on that list just because they look ridiculously cool. They do. But, uh,. Which was funny is, is I said to someone who's who I work with, who is also a 40k player, and I said, Forge World just knows how to kill me, and I show him a picture of the Phoenix Terminators. He's like, what, another $60 item? I'm like, actually, he's like, holy crap, they actually are 60 bucks. 
So, like, yeah. he guessed exactly how much the conversion rate was going to be before he even saw the price of them. Nice. I, so, they're $70, sorry. Yeah, it's, uh... Ooh, that's tough, because, um... There's a lot of cool stuff. Like, on one hand, I would want to get, like, some space for infantry things, but the other hand, it's like, screw it. Go for the expensive stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and it would be... I would have to go Thunderhawk. Oh, yeah, I did that, too. I have to go with, like, um, a Reaver Titan, mm-hmm. another Warhound Titan. Okay. So I have a little, like, so I have a little battle group of two Warhounds and a Reaver. And, um, so that's three, right? Yep. And then two more freaking Thunderhawks. <laughs> <laughs> because I could have a Deathwing Thunderhawk, a Ravenwing Thunderhawk, and a Battle Company Thunderhawk. Yep. I mean, the Manta's cool and all, but even if I were to get it from, like, for winning a lottery, you know, in this scenario, if I were to get it, the sheer, the sheer amount of work of just pre-work to get it to come together perfectly seamlessly to paint, and then yeah. mounting it on a dinner, a dinner plate, because that's what you need as a base for it. I, I, I don't know if you saw the picture. I think it was on GW's website. <clears throat> it was in Japan. A guy had a manta, but he had it on like a bar stool, like a mini bar stool. That was its base. Like the thing is huge. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's like, well, you can't even play with it on the battlefield. <laughs> like, um, I did watch a um, video from Blue Table, and the guy who was building it for a client was talking about how the thing was just so messed up. He had to like sand everything and reconstruct half the thing just to get it to work together. Yeah, and that that does happen with sometimes with their castings of things. Yeah, because of how they do it, um, from my understanding, like from stuff that I read, they basically they just plop the two pieces together and hope they don't move. Right. And sometimes they shift. That's why sometimes if you'll notice, you'll get like a like, let's just say for example a um, a space marine model and for some odd reason, there's this huge line, and the line kind of makes it look like those animes where the dude gets cut in half and he slightly shimps yeah. apart from each other. That tends to happen, is the bolts tend to slightly shift, and sometimes that causes the models to not fit completely. Yeah. At least that's what I read, that's how they did it. Like, they don't put any, like, stabilizer pins or anything inside the mold to make it stay together. It would be surprising if they really didn't, but I can kind of see sort of the reasoning. I don't know. It's also, it's, molds get old. Yeah. They do. That's why if there's ever anything that's on pre-order that you want, and you can, it's best to pre-order it. It is, because that's a brand new mold. Yep. And, I don't know, like, yeah, the Manta is just, it's so big and impractical to me to even feel on the battlefield. It's just, it's its a cool piece, and you would have to, like, I don't know, it just, it's just, it's just so massive. If the one benefit of, in this type of scenario, from getting the Manta is then all you need to do is buy an HQ and you've got a Tau army. Basically, you got it. Because the Manta comes with it. It's just, it's just so, just such a big, like, it's, it's. I'm all for gigantic cool things, but this is just like, yep. whoa. Yeah, <laughs> it's 34 inches is its wingspan. That's over That's over three feet. Well, three feet is 36. It's, so, then, so it's just under three yeah, feet. Yeah, that's, that's just under three feet dinner plate, basically. It's yeah. huge. <laughs> like, it's huge. It comes, it's so huge it comes with everything it can fit. Yeah, and really with little modification you could use those things. Um, yeah. The only thing that, um, actually, though, I believe that that in that one, the battle suits and the and the tanks are legit just kits. It's the orca that you need to do some work to make the battle suits work. The orca's cool too. Like I like the orca a lot. And it's a bit more practical to fly around a battlefield and move. Yeah. It's like, all right, guys, I'm moving the manta. Move, take everything off the field. I'm gonna move it and we'll replace everything. All right, because this is like. <laughs> So yeah, that's the one where you would need to do some modding because the legs are, don't really fit well right. with the um, battle suits. And because they're like bent. Really, the Manta is what we need an overhead like um, track that to move yeah. around for, just so you don't have it 
on the board. <laughs> you need to like suspend it from the ceiling and move it around on tracks just so you go. Basically, yep. you need a balanced track with a counterweight on one side because you need that track to be able to be to spin 360 so it could go on the angle that you want the manta to fly in. Yeah. And isn't it, since it's a flyer, I, I, I think it might have rules for hover, but doesn't it have to move forward if it doesn't? So it's, you're, you're forced to move it? <laughs> Only flyers with the hover special ability have that, and I don't know if the Manta does or not. I, I hope don't have they the thought, Imperial look on me. I hope they thought into that and gave it hover so you don't have to move it. Because if you have to move it, it's like, that's just cruel. You're forced to move this monstrosity. I would just hover it somewhere. And pretty much, like, I ain't moving it. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I'm not moving this thing. Uh huh. Don't 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 you even question <laughs> my 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 decision. <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna hover back here in the corner and blast everything to oblivion. I don't care if you would dis- if approve or not. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's happening. <laughs> and so, what do you think about the stalker hunter thing? The what, the, uh, the 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 new Rhino chassis. I think it's awesome. It looks pretty cool. I can't help but think of the 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 um, mortar turtle from Zoids when I see <laughs> the one tank with the mortar gun on it. And once again, we Dark Angels won't have it, but the Space Wolves and the Blood Angels will. I mean, it looks cool. I like the fact that like whatever pattern that has the two guns can like swivel independently. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I like the big old mortar looking thing. It, it mm. looks cool. I, again, I don't know the rules for it, so I don't know if I would want one or not. But I, what is interesting is they have. You look on the bottom of the of the tra- of it. They have like stabilizer pistons that come out. So I wonder what that yep. does. That's it's that's probably something to make it probably maybe shoot anti air or something, or it may have something to do with the shells that it fires. Um, one thing that I say to any like Dark Angel player that thinks this looks cool. Buy it now when it's 65. That way, when 7th edition comes out and we get it, you don't have to pay $80 for the tank. Yeah, if, if it does shoot up that high for that tank. I don't know. It, I'm, it's a, I'm just joking oh, yeah. off of all the price hikes that everyone's doing and everyone's reaction to said price hikes. The only thing I'm very upset about is, is we lost the customizable Space Marine Commander. Yeah... He was replaced with a dude who's one posed for the most part. Um, you can move his arm, and you can move his arm and his head to it, and he gets two helmets. That's why he's ten dollars more than the. Um, well, the space the commander here. is still available to buy. Um, I couldn't find him. He's in the HQ section. Bullet. I could not find him before. Did he hide on me? He's right underneath the Emperor's Champion. Is he? Yes. Space Marines. HQ. Oh, there he is. You know what it was? It was a different like, picture than what I'm used to. Of yeah, him. it's not. It's, it is a bit of a different picture. It's a light. It's the Lightning Claw version. Um. Yeah, nine different weapon options, three varying heads, additional parts for further. Okay, so we still have that. Yeah. Alrighty, but I do love how the librarian is ten dollars more than the Eldar Farseer, and he's ten dollars more because he's a librarian. <laughs> like he's he's literally a one pose wonder. He well, he's only a one set wonder. You get some custom ability because his chest can swivel on his hips. <laughs> Yeah, he, he's kind of an interesting pose. Um, I do like the look of him. I like the head. I, it's the it's pretty much the only unhelmeted head I like. It is a pretty cool unhelmeted head. It's, it's very librarian esque looking. I yeah. would. It, I I don't. I don't think he comes with a, an, an alternate head. If he came with a helmeted nope. head, I'd, I'd get him. No, he does not. Because that pose would look Speaking. awesome with a helmeted head. You could always easily convert that. Um, speaking of, I was reading a book, um, Angel Exterminatus, mm-hmm. and there's a scene in the beginning that I was like, this would be you if you were a space marine. <laughs> and it was um, this iron warrior. Um, that's the evil group, right? Yes, the iron warriors. Yes. He's comment- there's one of them, and he's commenting on how 
he keeps seeing people without helmets, and he keeps going idiot and starts shooting them in the head. <laughs> and then one of them he sees with uh, without his helmet, and he literally screams at him, do you people like getting shot in the head? <laughs> I read that book, I remember that, and it's true, I'm like, somebody, finally... <laughs> It's like, I was like, hey, finally someone gets him. It's a stupid idea. <laughs> and I do find it interesting that we have a Black Templar Crusader kit for $866. Well, let's, let's clarify that. It's, it's it comes with a lot, lot of stuff. <laughs> it's a lot of things. It come, I'm, just, I'm just surprised that out of all of the chapters... They made that one the special kit. Well, yeah, but and they, the thing is, I, they do have uh, other. If you go to Apocalypse Space Marine Formations, you'll find yeah. a whole bunch of other special kits. I think this is like a new one for the Black Templars. Yeah, this one comes with the Space the Emperor's Champion, one Chaplain with Croesus and Pat Plasma Pistol, one Scout Squadron, one Land Raider Crusader slash Redeemer, three s- Tactical Squads. Two assault squads, two stern guard veteran squads, two dreadnoughts, one space marine stalker hunter, one space marine centurion squad, one space marine raven, um, storm raven, and four black templar character upgrade frames. So you get a that lot. Is a lot. You, you're of basically stuff. if you bought, you buy that, and you have everything you would want. Well, not everything, but you have basically a very sizable force that you don't have to add to unless you want a specific yeah. little things. Um. And speaking of, the new Space Marine Tactical Squad is very awesome. I do like it, and I was shocked that it, A, it only went up to $40, which I think is fairly close to the old price, and B, it stayed at 10 men. Yeah, I, I'm glad it stayed at 10. Oh, yeah. And I do like all the bits, like the combi weapon kit. Oh, yeah, that, that combi weapon thing, I'm like, finally... Finally, they made it where we're not stuck with the copy weapon they decide to give us. The one thing I do wish that they did, and from what I can tell from the sprues they didn't, is give us more than just a missile launcher for a heavy weapon. Yeah. I don't want to have to go out and buy a Devastator Squad to get a heavy weapon that I want, because, you know, unless they change the rules and they can only have missile launchers now, I have no idea. I've not seen the new Tactical Squad rules, but... uh, I would assume... Well, rumor had it... Well. I believe it's the same as the Dark Angel one. Um, from things that I've read, I believe that the Heavy Flamer is only Stern Guard. Um, and I think the Tactical Marines just basically were a copy-paste. Which is a shame. I was hoping that the Dark Angels would be the only ones with Plasma Cannon. Again. But <laughs> you can't, um... Yeah. You can't get everything. You can't always Don't get enough. what you want. I'm done. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah, it would be nice if that happened again. And, yeah, the Heavy Flamer is only for Stern Guard. It's just that, you know, maybe you want a Heavy Bolter and you have the Squad, and now you got to go out and buy a yeah. Devastator kit. So it would have been cool if they included all the Heavy Weapons that Tactical Squads can do, but I can see why they yeah. didn't, because then it's like, you know. Granted, the Devastator kit is a very clever way of getting four squads Heavy Weapons and then end up with a five-man Tactical Squad at the end. Right. Because you take the four Devastators, put them into a ten-man tactical squad, take the the four dudes that you're replacing out, put them together, and take the sergeant that comes with the Devastator, and bam, a five-man squad. Yeah. Now, what I do like the most is the new way they're doing the bolters. Gone, it seems, is having to clip the stupid bolters and gluing them to the arm just to have them not fit quite right and look weird. Same with the plasma gun. Like, I had that issue with the tactical squad that I had. The plasma gun, the way that it's cut out, he could, I couldn't get the plasma gun on his arm because the thing was blocked by the shoulder pad. Yeah. And I had to literally cut the shoulder pad, a groove out of the shoulder pad to make the plasma gun fit in his hands. I do like that they're now molding the hands in the set. Yeah, it's like they learned from the Space Marine Commander box that that's a good way to make things fit right. Yeah. And not only that, but now you can finally do different... Like, the tactical squads are pretty much relegated unless you do the conversions to have it across their chest, the gun. Now you can have the gun out, you can have him look like he's reloading by holding a clip, or a magazine, I should say. You can have him holding a grenade. Like, it, like 
Do you have yeah, arms molded like, to hold things? And it, it actually looks like the hand, they give you a grenade hand now. They do. And uh, it just looks so much better because you don't have. You can do the classic just gun drawn pose. Now you can have it on you know one hand holding the gun, the other hand holding something else, the other hand doing nothing. You know you can do whatever you want and actually make it look more posability to it because tactics is why tend to be kind of static and posing because it's kind of like yep we got bolters. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and bolt pistols. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, the new arm molds is a clip. Yeah, which is cool. So now you can, like, do things. Like You hey. can cut off the clip of the other bolter and make it look like he's reloading. Yep, and um, you can you can actually have one hold a combat knife. Yeah. And Or hold an auspex. Mm, without it looking like it's just sitting in his hand. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I, what I do? And... I just think that's great. Like it just it just makes it easier. And if you're going, hey, I still have extra arm screws from my old squads, or my extra, you know, I could use some of these extra stuff to make incorporated with old things. All you gotta do is cut the hand off of the, um, the yeah. old arm and put that hand on it, and you're fine. So you, you, oh, it's, yeah. it's very salvageable. It looks like also from this one picture, they made it a little bit easier to make it look like they're leveling the gun with their eye. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, like, there's this one picture, the one literally legitimately has it, like, up at eye level. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, finally, like, the Imperial Guard. Yeah. You know, whether or and not I it's do like, easy to do that is another story, yeah. but at least it looks like it is. It looks like it's possible. Yeah. And I do like to do missile launcher launch pad. Makes more sense as to how the missile gets onto it. Yeah, and they basically took that from the Devastator kit and just put it in here. Yeah, which is cool. I like that. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool and it makes sense. I'm curious to see how gravity weapons work. Yeah, they look cool. They look interesting. I'm very curious to see how they work. If they work just like did Heresy, or if they don't. Huh. Which, I don't know. <clears throat> because, like, don't they have, like, weird rules in the Heresy game? Uh, maybe. Like, if I, if I understand now, I could be wrong. I believe it's something like, they roll, they they hit you. The unit then makes a toughness check or an armor, a toughness check or something like that. It's, it was and weird, they, yeah. And if they fail it, then they die, but then a marker is left there because anyone that walks into that area treats it as difficult terrain or something for a turn because of the gravity well that's left there. Yeah, it's something weird, and if they, if they take a wound and if they survive, then they're, like, they're like trapped in difficult terrain for, like, a turn. It's, it's, yeah. it's a little convoluted because I don't remember, so I can't really, like... I can't really just sum it up quickly, hmm. but it's, it was that's a bit different. That's something that I want to eventually pick up is, um, I'm thinking maybe for Christmas I'll get myself the Heresy books. And we got a second one coming out soon. Yeah? Yeah, um, they just announced the video release of it, and the guy that did Fulgrim is doing Ferris Manus. Cool. And... What's great is, is there's a YouTube video showing um, descri- um where the guy's talking about what it took to make the model and all the different ideas and what he wanted to achieve with it. Yeah. And he mentions at the end, he's like, oh, and I'm, we're going to be getting a f- I'm, my next bottle I plan to do next is Ferris Manus and have these sceneries, well, interact with each other to make like a neat diorama display. And someone comments going, holy crap, we're getting a Ferris Manus model. And someone replied with, with optional head. Yes. Because... <laughs> He does lose his head. But, uh, he does lose his head over Fulgrim's betrayal. Yeah, very good. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, very good. Here's a cookie. Now shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to a second book. I was kind of hoping that Imperial Fist would be in there, but probably not. Um, I think... Oh, uh, I saw the video. It was Raven Guard. Yeah. Iron, um, Iron Hands. Okay. Um, Salamanders. Interesting. And Night Lords. Interesting that they went three, a lo- three loyalists. I think it's because I think we only have one loyalist in Heresy. Actually, we don't. Do we even have a loyalist in Heresy? I don't think so. I think <laughs> it was to make. I think it was to represent the. Yeah, we don't have the, a loyalist. The big. Yeah, the big ones. That were a big part of the Istvan um, betrayal. Yeah, because they're all about the, the ones who betrayed. I was just really hoping for... Now, what's 
what I'm hoping for eventually. And there's going to be one with Space Wolves and probably Thousand Sons in it. And then in yeah. that book <clears throat> will be either either they'll make up rules for the custodian guard because they went there to fight as well. Yep. And Sisters of Battle. And Sisters of Battle. Either they'll do those two, or those two will be supplemental things in that book. And then, and because if they're going to keep it four legions per book, mm-hmm. then or if they're going to try to. Well, I did the math, and it's 18 legions. So if you do four legions per book, at least one book with two legions in it. Hmm. Which that makes right for Prospero because there was only two legions. Exactly, and then you had, and then you could have the Sodian Guard and the sisters and the Sisters of Battle. Whoops, the, the, yep. silent, the, the Sisters of Silent Hood, the Silent. What is this? Well, the Sisters of Silent Hood were part. Sisters of, of Silence. I keep getting them wrong. Yeah, yeah but the kind of that's that's all in gray area. But uh, mm. basically, well, it's a good way to bring in Sisters of Battle. Yeah. So the Sisters of Silence will. Um, could also have a, a full-on thing like they could be together as one thing and they could do something yeah. else but what I'm looking that, forward to also mm. is when they do the Imperial Fist because the Imperial Fist had two things they had a big space battle against the Iron Warriors and they also fought on Mars with the Loyalist mm. Mechanicum to see to like to take to basically loot and pillage all the gear they needed to defend the palace from and take up yeah. the Dark Mechanicum so I'm looking forward to that book, including more for the Mechanicum. Like, they, like the first book has some stuff for the Mechanicum. I look forward to the Imperial Fist. I don't know what other legions they throw on there. But, um, and then having some more, like, a more concrete Mechanicum army list. From what I've been reading, like, because, like, the Magnus Dominus and the new Mech Dude, they all appear in book two. I'm thinking that the Mechanicum may be the filler for um, books. It might so, be. like, in every book, they'll throw in something else, and so, hey, you don't play space... Hey, you don't play Space Marines, but hey, here's something to add to Mechanicum. Like, I think it's, like, just a tip of the iceberg for essen- essentially an enticement for the Imperial Guard players to pick it up each book because of Mechanicum. Maybe, but I also heard from Forgeville back when they first announced this that there will be some supplements in the coming books for aliens as well, like Eldar yeah. and stuff. So. Well, they have to do probably... Um, oh, no, the heresy happens before... The heresy happens after Eldrad warned Falgrim. Did that? No, yeah. the, her- the heresy happened after that, yes. Yeah, he, so, so we could that, do that... They could do that one. No, but uh, they could do well. They could do the thing that happens in Angel Exterminatus because that happens. That's during the in, during the heresy. And aren't the Eldar part of that? Yeah, that one, yeah. Well, in a way, um, if yeah. it's the Eldar are part of everything, but uh, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> but they could they they want to do supplements for Eldar, supplements for orcs, things like that. They just kind of entice more people to buy the book. I'm hoping yeah. that while Mechanicum gets supplemental stuff, I'm hoping they get this fun. Boom! Here's an army list for Mechanicum. The chances are that maybe a, one of the books may be dedicated to the Mars Rebellion. Yeah, which would have the Imperial Fists, um, the Mechanicum, Mechanicum, the Dark Mechanicum, Dark Mechanicum, which they might just do, and the Titan Legionnaire. Yeah, the Titan Legionaries would be in there as well, plus knights. Um, that's where we probably get the knights. <laughs> if they make knights, that would be awesome. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh. And that's the thing. I, I still stand, like, thinking about it, when I would love to make a 30K force. Mm. And I really think it would be, like I mentioned before, I think on the podcast, I don't know if it was or not, I would do Imperial Fist, but I'd do them under, under Sigismund. So they would basically be, like, the the um, the direct, you know, um, relatives to Black Templar. So they'd be Imperial Fist color, but with Black Templar heraldry, because that was Sigismund's heraldry. So mm. they would be yellow, but, like, they would have the cross on them and have some black and white on them and the cross and the storm shield might be the Templar's storm shield but with like an imperial fist on it as well or something you know like interesting like just cause cause he cause they adopted his direct heraldry so yeah I would do stuff like that like have like a storm shield be like the you know try to paint on a cross onto it like the iron cross whatever it is or just mm. have which is easy it's just four yeah. triangles meeting in the middle and have um have like on one side one shoulder pad would be the imperial fist icon and on the other shoulder pad instead of having like tactical spot marks or whatever it would be just a temple across mm. so like to represent like and then have Sigismund. men i would basically let's say made an awesome model for him i would basically yeah. just use the emperor's champion model for him um i've decided in 
30k like i'm starting to go getting into it like a lot of my forge world purchases are revolving around the heresy stuff yeah um emperor's children because I'm falling in love with Falgrim every time I read Angels Exter- Exterminatus. Ah, uh, you fool of a truck. I hate Falgrim. I, that book actually made me hate him more. And it really <laughs> made me respect the Iron Warriors. Perturbo is awesome. Perturbo is pretty ballin' in that. <laughs> but every time I see Falgrim, I'm like, okay, this guy is a, is a sissy, but I can get behind him because he can kill me at any minute, <laughs> even if I call him out on being a sissy. Right. He's a girly man of a Primarch, but he's a girly man that will cut your head off. <laughs> That's one of the things I like about that, is is, is um, not spoiling anything. There's one just chapter establishing a character, and he's got a dude's head sitting on a shelf, talking. <laughs> and he's working on the dude's body. Why? Because Fulgrim cut his head off and then said, put him back together. <laughs> and I'm like... That is awesome. He'll teach you a lesson by cutting your head off, but then he'll bring you back to life because you won't mess with him after he cuts your head off because you know he'll do it again. <laughs> That's true. That's like, he has some pretty – like the way he does stuff is pretty – like he's an interesting character. But every time I read about him and the Emperor's Children, I'm just more like uh, – and especially – that's the perfect ch- uh, lesion to mirror the Iron Warriors. Mm. The Iron Warriors are so – Elite, like the way I described it once was the Iron Warriors. When you look at Chaos, they're a legion. They, they're a Chaos legion now. Yes, they fell. Mm. They're they're they're, they're traitors, but they still operate under the idea of being a legion, a structured format. You know, everybody has their place, chain and command. You don't break that, and we will win because we are Iron Warriors, Iron within, Iron without. Yeah. Then you have the Emperor's Children, which we all know are falling into the botry of Slanish. So they don't follow a legion format at all. And they're just complete yep. chaos in comparison to this rigid structure. And it's a perfect mirror. And that's why I like Perturbo so much. Because Perturbo about, can lay the smackdown. If you read the book, he lays one heck of a smackdown. <laughs> um, I also think what I like about Falgrim as a fallen Primarch is the way that it happened. Because I decided to get clarification on exactly what happened to him. Yeah. Um, he was possessed by a demon in his sword, and the demon took over his body and locked him away in his head, um, and then painted, like, a portrait of him to, like, mock him. So when he was, so when he'd commune with Fulgrim in his head, he'd have an image to look at. Right. And while Fulgrim was there, he was going, well, I have nothing better to do. Oh, hey, there's a gateway to this being that's this dude is talking, communing to. Hey, weird dude named Slanesh, teach me stuff. <laughs> and then he learned a bunch of stuff from from um, Slanesh, and then when the Legion decided to quote, they decided to do this ancient, this taboo form of exorcism, which is exorcism via torture. They basically torture the body to the point where the demon says, I'm out of here. Yeah. And so Falgrim used that to exercise the demon and put it in the painting that he made of him so he could talk to him as a bit of a irony sake. And then Falgrim went and looked and said, okay, I killed my brother. I basically slaughtered half my my battle brothers. I communed with dark spirits. Why stop now? Yeah, you know, it's it's true. But and and I like, it's a bit of a retcon, too, uh, with the Fulgrim's backstory, because he originally, the way it was written is that he was basically, a, he was the only Primarch to lose himself completely and become a demon, because the demon took yeah. him over. But it's cool. It's a cool story. It represents, he goes, well, that's my mama, and continues going I on. Like, I like how it's basically, he does hate the fact. He hates what he did, but he understands, but he's going with it because he's like, there's no possible way for me to ever make up for what I did so I might as well not try yeah the thing I like about Perturbo and the thing that I really maybe like him more is that you know when you think of the, you think of the traitor leaders like they're traitors they're chaos and he's talking yeah. with, again he's talking with but then one of his advisors or whatever uses the word loyalist and yes. Perturbo flips his lid and goes if they're loyalists what does that make us you know yes. it's like we are not traitors is the way he went to it's like we're doing this for a reason so we are loyal to our cause how dare you say that loyalist yep. that makes us the traitor when they're the traitor yeah. that's, a, that's in the very beginning when they're 
planning a battle plan. He's talking to his triad. Yeah. And one of the triads say, um, the newest of the triad says, what about the loyalist? And he freaks at them. Yeah, and I like that because it's like, you know what? Bravo, Perturbo. You make a good point. You did this yeah. for whatever reason. And what I like about it is it's the, it's very demon lacking. Like, there's no, mm. like, subtle whisper in his ear. He did this because he went, you know what? I'm sick and tired. This is what I believe. This is what I believe. This is what has to happen because the Emperor just used my legion. I'm sick and tired of it. And you know what? I'm done. And we are loyal to our cause. And how dare you say they're loyalists when they betrayed us. I did like that idea how a lot of his backing is, I bit like, like, a, like one piece that just chipped at him was he built, like, for those who don't know, he built the theater where the trial of Magnus happened. Yeah. And he didn't, he built it for the Emperor because the Emperor asked asked for it, but once he found out what the Emperor was using it for, he was like, no, I did not build this theater to be a place of trial to basically persecute my brother. Yeah, he's like, I did not build this, this was- to condemn my brother. So, and then he got pissed that it was destroyed afterwards. He's like, I put in all that work, and you blew it up after one event? <laughs> like, why couldn't it stay there and be used for what I built it for? Yeah. And but I'm not, I just like, without giving away anything, like how he's, he's more than just a, a primark and a warsmith. He's also an architect. Like, he's really... Yep. He just, he's, he's got a hobby. He's a layered character, which you don't think when you first think of Perturbo, the yep. Iron Warriors. And I like... That's what I like about these books. Some people, like, scoff at the books of reading them. And, like, it's a cash cow, yes. Yes, it is. Mm. I wish I could get on that cash cow. But... Yeah. It's, um... But also... But we can't write stories about space marines. Yeah. But also, it, it's a great way... It's really giving us insight into the Horus Heresy, and let's be honest, bef- this, these books started, I'd say, five years ago or so. I forget exactly. Mm. They started a while ago. Before that, such a monumentous, important event that set the structure for how 40k is is now with everything, basically. This whole reason we have the Eye of Terror, not have the Eye of Terror, but why there's chaos in there, why there's chaos space marines, why the Imperium's in the state it is. It's such a huge set up for 40k and yet nothing was known about it for the longest time mm. and you like you make a great point in with Perturbo and I like I like I like it also in the book um, Fall, um, Fallen Angels yeah. is in that one and in this one they're making like they make Perturbo and Lionel Johnson very human yeah and like the ending to Fallen Angels was just hilariously ironic and shows just how human these people can still be yeah unlike some books where they just make them go oh very very much the the deus ex machina that everyone sees them as oh i didn't fail in the middle of the book i let him beat me now i'm actually gonna try this time yeah and rip him in half without effort and really what i like about the way that the authors have been describing primarchs is they give them very human qualities all of them like even Gimon, or however you pronounce his freaking name of the ultimate. Yeah, him. Yeah, him. He's, um, when in the book No No Fear, when you read about him and he does stuff, he is very awesome. <laughs> like, he's, mm. he's very cool. Like, I got mad props to that, to the character. Uh, Which is, he's the Ultramarines <clears throat> dude, right? Yep. That's mad props because Ultramarines, I always felt, are the most dull. They're the most, I feel, see, the problem with the Ultramarines is being that they're the they're the very much by the book. They're the, they are what they're the Boy Scout. Yeah, they are what the Space Marines kind of are generically. Yeah, they view very vanilla like, and then not much is done for them to, to kind of alleviate that. When really they got a lot going on there. And to anyone who is a Boy Scout that wasn't a a punch no. at the Boy Scouts, I I was a Boy Scout too. It's just like it's essentially you know they're the Boy Scouts. They do it. They follow the rules. They don't deviate from the rules. If the book says this, that's what they do. That's what I mean by that. You know, it's like they're kind of bland compared to some of the other chapters that throw the book out. And it's funny, and this isn't giving away anything, but Gimon says at one point in one of the books that he goes, <coughs> this codex I'm writing, it's just guidelines. Sometimes you have to be unpredictable. <laughs> they're more like guidelines. Actual. He's like, you know what? He's like, he's like, I can't possibly write down every everything that could possibly happen. So you're gonna need to think for yourself. Well, G- that's that's based off the whole irony thing that um, GW likes. Like, isn't like the iron like the iron hands? They're all oh, the flesh is weak. We must 
repeat, we must replace it with metal like our Primarch and Ferris Manus was like, these implants are a weakness. They're a crutch. I hope to one day get rid of them. Kinda. It's not. It's, it's not. It's less of just outright irony thing. I think with the whole thing with Ferris Manus, what he was describing was, you know, we the flesh is weak should not be taken so literally. You yeah. Better better yourself. And if it, if you, yeah. have to, you have to cut off an arm and put a bionic one on, and so be it. But you have to better yourself. <laughs> Um, and the ultramarine and, and Gaiman's like listen these are very important when I'm writing down but you know sometimes you gotta go screw it ram it and that's it like, like in the um, like in the video game where yeah. the commander is like in the beginning is like don't take the codex so literally my friend <laughs> basically and the thing when you look at ultramarine history there's, there's plenty of captains who are pretty much going who, who have been chastised for not following the codex perfectly they're going listen I had to ram it with my tank because that's killed it, so that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I killed it. Why are you? Comp- they're standing. We're standing. They're not. What more do you want? Basically, and um, and for all the primers, like the the book Legion, I think was done so well for the Alpha Legion. It made me made me go look at the Legion, going from eh to huh. They're pretty interesting, and the Primark is as well. Hmm. Uh, the, Korax, reading about him in the book Korax, I think it was. Um, very made him. I always thought he's kind of cool, but I like how he's so re- like reserved. But in battle, he's like a berserker. Mm. Like I like. You know, you should do. Age. You should do a book corner on half these books. <laughs> I have to, I, yeah, I could do that. But uh, and tell me which ones you did, so I don't read them and then do book reports on them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, I mean, Rogel Dorn, very cool. All of the promise. Which one was he again? The Imperial Fist. Okay. I can never remember. I can remember some. Like I remember, I remember Space Wolves, Dark Angels, um, Emperor's Children. I remember Thousand Suns. I rem- I can remember Iron Warriors now, Iron Hands, and Raven Guard and Night Lords to extent. But I can never remember all of them. Yeah, the Night Lords is cool because Conrad Kerr's aka the Night Haunter. He has a cool story arc behind him, like why he does what he does. And um, I didn't. I didn't realize he actually slit Johnson's throat once. Yeah, I mean, it was it was just a cut. <laughs> but I was just like, "Whoa, he almost killed him." He slit his throat. He 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 um, bum rushed Rogel Dorn and cut up his chest. But hmm. at the same time, he slit Johnson's throat, and Johnson basically bashed his skull in at the same time. So yeah, it's just... and then yeah, and then Johnson in their final fight left him with eleven fatal wounds. Yeah, basically Johnson killed him in like. 30 seconds, nearly killed him in 30 seconds. <laughs> yes, yes. Let us let us be correct. It was a assassin that killed him. Yeah, yeah. Because Con- Conrad Kerr's lived through the heresy, but yes, a Kalitz assassin but, supposedly supposedly killed him. Yes, no one knows what happened, but he his activity has disappeared since. Yeah, but I did like that that um I did like that the whole rivalry between him and Johnson was more of a just, well, we started this fight, we're going to fight each other until it's over. Yeah. It was good. I, I liked it. And through that, I, I, I've i always liked Lionel Johnson. But seeing oh, just yeah. how much of a knight he is and how, like, the thing I like about him is, and the way they, re- they wrote him right, he doesn't, he's not flashy with any of his movements, but he's very precise. So mm-hmm. that's why he's such a skilled fighter. And he's got a, he's a skilled tactician. He's got that feral nature to him. And at the end, at the very end, without giving anything away, when he's sitting in his throne room talking to the figure, I thought was brilliant. Like I think it. Which book is this then? I forget. That might have been a short story, like one of the novellas, when he got when his ship got caught by demons and he had to fight them off, or it might okay. or it might have been. I think it might have been that. I have to double check where it is. But hmm. he he basically, I thought they did that well. And really, because I want to read that story. It's a good story. Basically, he he but, he kills. A like Lord of Change. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, is it is this in that Night Lords trilogy? Not in the trilogy itself. This is this is um this is or is it part of that Primarch story? It might it might have been in the Primarch's book. Mm. Like where they have a collection of novellas in there. Yeah, it might have been that one or the one before it. Yeah, the one thing I will say that I'm not a fan of, but they are getting better at it, is that prior to they were very. Um, very um, um, oh, has vague on when books were sequels or not. Because I purchased a book yeah. recently, um, Void Walker, where the Night Lords are being chased by the Eldar, 
Yeah, that's, and, that's part of the like Night Lord trilogy, right? Yeah, and someone's like, oh, that's like the last book in a trilogy. I'm like, it's a trilogy? <laughs> because when I read the description of it on the book, nothing ever says that there's a trilogy. They never, they never go the final chapter of the story. They just talk as if it's its own standalone. It's like, I wish I knew there was two other books for this. Yeah. But and as the thing with the Horus Heresy, when I first started reading them, like, books one, two, and three are basically, like, a trilogy. Yeah. Even up to four. Books one, two, three, and four kind of go together. And, um... But, so, then I got to thinking, well, is every book this? And then when you start reading, like, Fulgrim's not that. You know, like, you don't have to read one, two, three, and four to read Fulgrim or, or, or any of the yeah. other ones. So, it, it, it is a bit weird here and there because you go, wait, which one's which? But, uh... And do I need to follow, read one to understand the other? Thankfully, not all of them require that. Yeah, which is... Like, good. you can read Fallen Angels without reading Descent of Angels. Yes. Yeah. You just miss out on some insider info on the two main characters exactly which is which is good but i mean so that's one thing you know they could be a little bit clearer about what comes after what in like a direct se- sequel type of thing yeah but they don't i think their authors that they've chosen have all done a good job you know whether some people for example one book that kind of was not very is not very popular is um i believe battle for the abyss okay uh that's when the uh it's very naval oriented and that's where the rolling broadside comes from. Really? That because basically um, there was a thousand sun ship with one thousand suns marine on it, you know, mm-hmm. sorcerer type guy, who okay. who basically had to break the council and use his psychic abilities to keep everybody alive. And uh, he basically banished an entire demon ship by himself because he's awesome. But mm. his ship was being attacked mercilessly. Like he was, he went up to kind of talk to them. He got attacked, and his ship was way outclassed. So what he did is he broadsided them, did a barrel roll, broadsided them again, barrel roll, broadsided them. So he constantly like reloaded and just did a roll, called a rolling broadside, which was really interesting. Cool, which is, makes total sense in space <laughs> when you're fighting against one ship. You just roll it and you shoot him with everything. And what's cool is that it was apparently a thing in, in 40k naval lore is when a ship does a rolling broadside, it represents a last ditch effort to try and hurt the enemy and protect the fellow comrades. So the other naval officers were like deeply moved by that. Because huh. <laughs> they were like, he's sacrificing his ship and himself to just try and buy us some time. So Interesting. So it was a cool thing, but it, it, it was kind of a weaker book. The characters were done well, but it's just, it, it, it was very much more of a niche book because it was very naval battle oriented a little bit and dealing with like a little bit of political intrigue within within different legions. Uh-huh. But it was all right. I mean, I enjoyed it. That's where I got the idea to make a Thousand Sons Army of Preheresy, and this was from that one character. But, uh, oh, this is interesting. Um, just looking because I wanted to read up on this Battle of the Abyss book. Yeah. For two hundred dollars, you can get the Horse Heresy ebook e bundle. It gives you ni- all 19 novels in the Horus Heresy series, plus novellas collected in the Prime Arch and 18 short stories, all in ebook form. Comes with Horus Rising, False Gods, Galaxies and Flames, Flight of the Elistian, the, 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 yeah. the, the Eisenton or whatever, yeah. Fulgrim, Descent of Age, Angels, Legion, Battle for the Abyss, Mechanicum, Tales of Heresy, Short Stories, Anthology, Fallen Angels, A Thousand Suns, Nemesis, The First Heretic, Prospero Burns, Age of Darkness, The Outcast Dead, Deliverance Loss, No No Fear, The Primarchs, Army of One, Cryptos, Shadow of Treachery, Fear to Tread, and Angels Exterminatus. That's interesting. It sounds like a lot for ebooks, but you get a lot. But You're getting a lot. Yes. Yeah. But the one thing I wish they would do is stop doing the whole limited edition books that come out for a little bit and then maybe they'll come out later because mm. I bought one I bought one it was the White Scar book it might have been called White Scar I don't remember um, it was very cool it gave me a lot of insight into Jahagati Khan or however you pronounce his name he's a pretty cool Primark they're all pretty cool the authors have done a very good job of describing them but you know it's not fair to White Scar fans who maybe couldn't get in on that you know, or didn't even know that it existed until now. Exactly. So I, I would like for those stories to come back, like just to, just to buy. But like I was saying, the Primarchs, the way the authors, I think every book, whether people enjoy the book or not, part of it is yeah, 
how the author does it, but I think the authors have written pretty well, and let's be, let's be reasonable here. This is just fan service 40k novels. These aren't like War and Peace or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> this is just, this is just like 40k, feel good, read them up, have fun novels. And they did mm. a very good job with them. Um, oh yeah. And the primers have been just, all the primers I've read about have always been like cool, whether I like them or not. They just, they've done a good job. And the Primarchs had, like, like, great job with Magnus. They made me like the Lehman Russ Primark a lot. There, the one scene in Prospero Burns, I sit there and I go, okay, Russ, I respect you for that. Exactly. I, 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 that, I like that. That's one time that, I, that I'm okay with Russ. And, like, and as a character, Russ is pretty interesting because this isn't the first time I've heard about the... What they what is implied there, but how mm. how his whole acting savage amongst his legion is an act. Yeah, like they indicate that in a Thousand Suns too, where he's like, "Oh, just lighten up, dude." Yeah. <laughs> like like the, like he's putting on an act in front of his legion, where really he's like every other Primarch, you know, perfectly enunciated and everything, because he's a Primarch, yep. but he's acting lesser, if you will, to kind of fit in with his legion. And I like that. I like it's kind of it's kind of like a burden he has to do. Mm. And it's it's just a cool little concept. These little twerks that they give to characters to make them ha- in- more interesting. Interesting. interesting that being this perfect being. So yeah, um, they're all done pretty well. And of course, I like that. I'm, I'm happy how they went with the lion because they just sh- I'm finally, like finally showing the lion is awesome and not just saying well rumor has it he's pretty good. So yeah, like, rumor has it he might have been the war master if horse wasn't found first. Yeah. At least now we know it's true. Exactly. <laughs> and one last thing before we go in case anyone hasn't heard in the digital version of the Codex Space Marines they introduced a army builder app. <clears throat> that's only available in the Space Marines Codex right now. Chances are, if it's very popular, it will go, you know, in the app. Um, it's not working right now <laughs> because app, they're having issues on Apple's end. Apple is having some issue where it can't work. So Games Workshop is working on it, but they promise anyone who purchased the book, pre- pre-ordered the book, or purchased the book here on will get it wet as an update when they finally get the app to work. That's cool. Now, you know, there's a whole bunch of army build. There was a, 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 quite a few army builder programs back in the day. I don't know what still is around now and what people use. I use Microsoft Word. <laughs> That's yeah. how I type it. I use Excel. That's how I type it because ain't nobody got time for that. But it, I use Excel. Um, I did hear army builder is still around, but they're going no more subscription fee or something like that. Some weird ruling like that. Right. Like, there was a whole article about how is this fair to everyone who paid for it all these years and such, and I don't understand what the whole deal is. If anyone knows, leave a comment and let us know. Exactly. Please. But this is interesting that they put it with the Space Marine Colors because back in 4th edition, and I own this as on a CD, is uh, they had an army builder program through Games Workshop for their armies. Yeah, and that kind of never really got updated or, or or backed very well. And then, you know, as things got changed, they just basically scrapped the project. Yeah, this would be interesting if they're able to offer it to any everybody, not just I. Well, I think that what they're doing first is is I think they're going to do like they did with the eBooks. They're going to first try. Um, they're trying with the Space Marines first to see if people use it and see if it gets good reviews. Then maybe they'll do an individual app at that point. They may most likely start it off with iPad and then make a cheaper version on digital books, but just say, oh, the iPad one has some slight difference to it. Like, maybe it has the ability to look up the rules like some of the other books can do. Because right. I think that's one thing the e-books can't do. Like, on the iPad versions, you tap a um, you tap an item, it gives you the special rule. I don't think you can do that on the Kindle versions. Um, my... It, my I, my question would be is will it up will it be like will it be like um will it be like War Room where you buy it once and every new addition new new add on is free like let's just say for example like Tyranids Tyranids haven't gotten a new book yet so say the app comes out before the Tyranids come out so we only have what's new for the Tyranids now 
would we get a free update on the Tyranids when their 6th edition book came out, or would they pull the, oh, no, you got to buy it for $2 to replace the ones you got? Right, and that, that's the thing. It's just that, you know, it's interesting. I'd like to see more with it personally. Mm. And um, speaking of that, though, I'm still waiting for the freaking Farsight Enclave to come out in a hard copy. <laughs> It's not out yet? I think it comes out in October as a hard copy. Interesting. I think. Yeah, October 2013, Farsight Enclave Codex Cow Empire Supplement. Well, you know why they do that? They do that to try and prolong it as much as possible to hope that you'll say screw it and buy a digital version. Yeah, but what? No. That's the one they want you to buy. Two things. Firstly, A, I don't have an iPad. <laughs> so I don't have an i thing to run it. So I can't. So I, I'm forced to wait. Um, they do make a Kindle version, so you can run it on your um your smartphone. Yeah, that's too small of a screen. <laughs> I, but I'm just that's the, again that's their justification going. Oh, there is a Kindle version. Yeah, it's just it's like I'm waiting because I want to read it. I want to do I want to do a little review for Fearless Games on that. When I want to try and get you know a video going again around uh, where I'm at. It's proven more difficult than I thought, but um, I want to. I would like to go over the far side enclave for two reasons. A, far side enclave. Far side. <laughs> no, said that's my favorite part of Tau. B, um, this was a supplement I did not ex- I did not see coming, so I want to read it and get a good feel for it before I give my thoughts. Mm-hmm. And C, I may have use for this in the future. So, <laughs> uh, so I gave you three reasons for the price of two. And the price of two was to listen to me. So ha. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. That's 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 my thoughts. On, I, I, that's what bothers me about these digital versions of stuff. I have mm-hmm. no problem with digital, but this don't make us wait three, four months for the hard copy. Yeah. It's not fair. <laughs> the only thing that the only reason why, like one, I got into it because I made a mistake. For those who don't know, I purchased the Altar of Battle book for Dark Angels thinking, okay, I'll just read it on iTunes and there'll be no problem. I didn't know the ebooks only work on the iPad and the iPod touches. So I was like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> and that was my birthday present from my parents was an iPad. And so I'm now seeing the benefits of it. I don't need to bring like 20 billion books with me now like I used to in 3.5 edition. Oh, yeah. It, where it makes I perfect had, sense. It's just... Yeah. But I can I can get the, the hatred of them holding off for so long. But on the business side, I understand where they're going. They're trying to... Essentially, it's their way of trying to wean you off books and onto digital media. I, I get it. It's just, you know... As it yeah. stands, I have no. You don't have. Way you don't have to like it. Yeah, I, you can get it. You just don't need to like it. Yeah, and I just I'm hoping in the future that I'll eventually get some type of digital media reading thing that's not a phone. But mm-hmm. I'd have no real desire or need to. And as long yeah. as the books are made, I won't be like, well, can I get one? Because I, yeah. I like the tactile feel of the books myself. I like mm-hmm. be able to just flip a page and go, okay, this is where it is. But it's just. I, Three months is a bit long. Yeah, it's a bit long. Yeah, <laughs> like we've yeah. had a, we've had codex, a codex come out in between that. I mean, this is a bit long. <laughs> it could also be just guessing. It could also be seeing if the thirty-two dollar price range is justifiable. Yeah, like they may be going okay. If the book sells for thirty-two dollars on ebook like hotcakes, then we can charge fifty dollars for the hardcover. But if it goes oh. This digital book, we're selling one every two months. Okay, we better only charge 30 bucks for this one. Maybe the fear, maybe what they're actually trying to check out is seeing what they can get away with price-wise. It might, it might. Which, so so people who vote, if you vote with your wallets, things will happen. It just takes, and, it takes time, but it will. Yes, it will. And on that note, I think we are done. Yep. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us. Uh, again... The information that we weren't sure about, feel free to let us know in the cast, which is about um, Army Builder, what's going on with that. And if you know where that book about the Night Lord versing the line is, let us know also. We'll want to read that more. And let us know, if you haven't already, which five, any five, 
Forge World models would you pick if someone just said, pick it and I will buy it for you, I don't care how much? Yeah. And with that, thank you all for watching again. If you haven't, liked and subscribe. And until next time, Fearless Gamers, this is Matt the Vet. James the Wildcard. Take care. Peace.